Dr. Tim Lenton, Director of the Global Systems Institute and Chair in Climate Change and Earth System Science at the University of Exeter. So my job is to introduce uh, and give an overview of tipping points in the Earth system. I want to start with a simple toy model of a system that I'm going to force past a tipping point um, just to get us keyed into what we're thinking about. So this is a system with two alternative stable states. Um, it started as denoted by the ball in the left-hand one, but over time I'm forcing that state that it's in to become less stable or less resilient. That means the damping feedbacks that maintain stability are getting weaker all the time and the reinforcing feedbacks that can propel change are getting stronger until at some point they're gonna take over uh, there and cause a self-propelling change of the system from the one uh, basin of attraction to the other. If I just run it one more time, I'll add that if you watch the ball closely, you can see some characteristic behavior before the tipping point. A given nudge is gonna move the ball further the nearer you are to the tipping point. So the variance in the system goes up, but also the ball recovers more slowly from perturbations because the slope has declined. And that means, um, one sort of position of the ball or time point becomes more like the next. So the autocorrelation of the system in time goes up and those are generic early warning signals. So tipping points are recognized across a whole range of earth systems, climate systems and ecological systems. My, and I've put them on a bunch of those on different time and space axes here. And gold, as you can see in the key, is denoting big scale climate earth system tipping points. Um, blue, green and sort of grey are different ecological realms of tipping points or regime shifts as ecologists would call them. And then red are tipping points in social systems, some good, some bad. And right in the middle, the one that I guess we're all here to try and avoid, another civilization collapse. Well, I'm going to start up in the top right, but the talk's going to migrate uh, down, down leftwards. But let me start with some tipping points in the deep history of our planet. And uh, this is a kind of cartoon summary of oxygen levels over Earth history on the y-axis and time through Earth history on the x-axis. And the key point is that there was a profound tipping point halfway through the planet's history that geochemists call the great oxidation event or episode when we went from an anoxic atmosphere to an oxidizing atmosphere. And it was irreversible. We also think it was abrupt, although it might have been oscillatory in the transition. There was a second major tipping point much more recently in Earth history, only six or 700 million years ago, still seems like a long time ago, when there was a second rise in oxygen, but there were also at least two so-called snowball Earth events, which involved profound climate tipping points to an ice-covered Earth and then snapping out of that into a kind of hothouse Earth. If we zoom in much more recently to the last 66 million years, the Cenozoic era, well, recent work has shown rather elegantly that you can extract evidence that there are like four different global climate states that are ex that the Earth has sampled, if you like, or been through in the last um, 66 million years, dubbed the hot house, warm house, cool house, and ice house, with sometimes abrupt transitions between them. For example, from the sort of warm house uh, of the Eocene at 34 million years ago, the Earth went into the cool house um, of the Oligocene with the first major growth of an ice sheet on Antarctica. Now, much more recently, we've gone into the ice house of glacial interglacial cycles. That was a sort of tipping point into the ice house. There's another tipping point around 900,000 years ago where we went from 41,000 year to 100,000 year ice age cycles. And then if we look within the last ice age, well, we see just in the last, zooming into the last 80,000 years here, we see the iconic example of abrupt climate changes. So this is a proxy of temperature as recorded in an ice core in Greenland, and it's showing 20 numbered so-called Danskard Oshkar events in which the climate warms up to 15 degrees centigrade at the ice core site in Greenland in a time span that can be as short as one to two decades. 
and those abrupt climate changes had global effects, most pronounced in the North Atlantic region, but seen throughout the Northern Hemisphere and with, with echoes in the Southern Hemisphere. Yeah. And if we zoom in just to the last 30,000 years of that record, we start to see some more of the structure. Arguably, we see the slowing down of climate fluctuations, particularly after this bolling Alarod warming 14.7 thousand years ago. Uh, perhaps a forerunner or a warning that we were going to snap out of the last ice age finally about just under 12,000 years ago. And whilst we all, as pale paleoclimate people, like to think that the Holocene, the last 10,000 years ago, 10,000 years or so, is more stable, um, and it looks that way in this Greenland record. Actually, in the tropics, we know there are abrupt switches on and off of monsoon systems, that are some of which are correlated with the rise and fall of past civilizations. So what about the future? Well, back in September, we published, uh, led by Dave Armstrong and McKay, a, a synthesis of around 230 studies and drew up a, a, a fresh map, a list of um, the, what we call the tipping elements, the bits of the climate system that we think there's good evidence to think could be tipped by global warming this century. We split that into two categories. And this first category is the global core climate tipping elements, where if they tip the whole, you feel it in the whole climate system. Um, some of these have been on my maps for 15 years or so now, but some are new, like a, a tipping point in the collapse of convection in the Labrador Sea which could happen at low temperatures, unfold in about a decade, give a, like a transition to a little ice age like climate in Europe, up to a foot of sea level rise along the northeast seaboard of North America, and the models would suggest would disrupt the West African monsoon. We also have a category of what we call regional impact tipping elements. So you tip these, maybe you don't feel it or see it in the whole climate system, but my word, people have got good reason to care about it. Because for example, um, a tipping of the loss of, on the large scale of low latitude coral reefs, well, 500 million people or more depend on them for their livelihoods. We also have regional monsoon systems, for example, in this list. So part of the evidence to put things on these maps comes from evidence that these systems have tipped in the past, particularly the great Atlantic Ocean overturning circulation. But also some of the information comes from future model projections. So this is a summary of where do abrupt shifts happen in climate model projections uh, of the future um, from the last sort of penultimate generation of climate models. And so you see spatially the letters denoting where they happen but the color scheme shows you at what warming level they happen. And if you're watching closely, you'll see that a bunch of abrupt shifts happen at relatively low levels of global warming above pre-industrial in the model worlds, including that one I mentioned in the Labrador Sea, but several others as well. Then we can also learn something from offline models. So mod models of slow systems like the major ice sheets, like this one in Antarctica, subjected to a steady warming and have kept close to equilibrium. You see at around two degrees centigrade of global warming there, the prediction is that the West Antarctic ice sheet is unstable at equilibrium. It'll take a while to melt, that's for sure, but it's the tipping point is just around two degrees C. And if we keep warming up this Antarctic model, keep holding it close to equilibrium, well, we lost the Wilkes Basin uh, somewhere in the simulation, another marine grounded ice sheet. And now at about seven degrees C of global warming, the whole East Antarctic ice sheet basically goes. So that's another source of model based evidence. And then we have what we actually see in observations. So this is my potted summary of some of the observational element uh, evidence um, that key tipping elements are experiencing accelerating change in the wrong or the undesirable direction, including the West Antarctic ice sheet, where we can't rule out that part of it um, has passed a tipping point, part of it that drains enough ice to raise sea levels by about 1.3 metres worldwide. Similar, I'm afraid, evidence of uh, accelerating ice loss in Greenland, and then also uh, distinct 
uh, slowing down being inferred in the Atlantic's great overturning circulation, as well as the well-known uh, accelerating loss of Arctic sea ice and some uh, unprecedented droughts in the Amazon. So changes in the mean state of systems, as summarized here, can give some clues to where the tipping might be approaching. But if we remember the movie at the start, looking at how the fluctuations of systems are behaving is also informative. And if a system is heading for a, towards a tipping point, we expect to see the variance in the fluctuations increasing in amplitude and also the fluctuations to become more persistent, which we measure as an increase in something we call AR1 or time time autocorrelation at lag one. And so the variance is the middle row here. Autocorrelation is the bottom row. And the top row is some observational data with the mean trend line in red removed before analyzing for the other statistics. And we're looking at how the Arctic sea ice September extent shows clear signals of destabilization consistent with heading towards a tipping point, as does the central western Greenland ice sheet as does the overturning circulation of the Atlantic. These methods cannot tell us uh, in any sense how close we are to the tipping point, or at least they don't tell us that here. But in the case of the Greenland ice sheet example, the curvature in the data suggests tipping point would be imminent for that part of that ice sheet. We can also do this with remotely sensed data. So now for the Amazon, we look at fluctuations in vegetation optical depth, it's called, which is a kind of proxy for biomass of the Amazon forest and its water content. And as the colours were getting lighter through the 1990s, that was the Amazon nominally getting more stable, but they're getting darker now through the 2000s up towards the present. And that's a very distinct signal of uh, destabilization, or we would say loss of resilience of the Amazon rainforest that's most pronounced and consistently over the last 20 years. I'll uh, just flick on and summarize that in a slightly different way. Where the colors are red here is the strongest loss of resilience in the observational data over the last 20 years. Where they're blue, they may be gaining resilience and gray is neutral. We could correlate the places losing resilience with being biased towards the drier parts of the forest and being biased towards places closer to human activities, which all makes kind of intuitive sense if a little sobering. So all of these sources of information are feeding into this um, synthesis of the 230 papers that we put together to try to summarize in the burning embers where in terms of global warming on the y-axis we assess the tipping point to be for, for all these tipping elements arrayed along the bottom, where um, there starts to be, say, one model that expresses a tipping point that the, marks the lower end of the color scale, like white to yellow, and the last model to tip, if you like, would be the dark red marking the top of the color bar. And the black dotted lines are our subjective best estimates of where we think the tipping point might be for each system. Suffice to say that at the current level of about 1.2 degrees centigrade of global warming, we think um, five, five systems are at some risk of tipping. Uh, the first four there in the Labrador Sea. At 1.5 degrees C of warming, our best estimate is that tipping could become likely in the Greenland ice sheet, West Antarctic ice sheet, low latitude coral reefs and a chunk of the boreal permafrost. Each of them has their own characteristic time scale over which change would then unfold. It's still quite slow in the ice sheets, but considerably faster in the coral reefs. And a really sobering observation is that current, current policies are taking us to about two and a half or 2.6 or 7 degrees centigrade of global warming, which, if we were right, would suggest 13 of these tipping elements are at risk. Three of them, we'd be fairly confident we'd have already tipped. Uh, one, two, three, four, maybe, well, four or further ones would be at high risk. And there's another six at some risk. So that's what the picture you get if you consider them in isolation, these tipping systems. But of course, the Earth system is interconnected in a way that tipping one thing can influence the likelihood of tipping another. Could go in either direction. But unfortunately, there are some cases where the evidence is building that tipping one thing makes tipping another more likely.
So the, the incredible warming of the Arctic linked to the loss of sea ice um, is making it snow and rain more in the Arctic, adding fresh water to the North Atlantic. It's accelerating the melting of the Greenland ice sheet, adding fresh water to the North Atlantic. Both of those sources of fresh water are contributing to slowing down the Atlantic overturning circulation, um, which is at risk at some point of tipping. And we know from Earth's history that when you slow that down, you disrupt the monsoons around the tropics, including in the Amazon, West Africa and India. You leave heat behind in the Southern Ocean, which is the major risk factor for the West Antarctic and the East Antarctic ice sheets. So that's the information synthesized on the likelihood of big scale climate tipping points. If we wanted to do a risk assessment, we'd want to know what are the impacts of passing those tipping points, as well as what's the exposure of people in different places and to those impacts, as well as other ecosystems. And to me, it's amazing how little research overall has been done on the impacts of passing tipping points. This table is just there to give you a flavor that we have some information and some some judgment, but the one, the only one that's really been studied in considerable depth is a collapse of, collapse of what's called the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, or AMOC for short. And in climate models, several groups have tri caused the tipping point in this system to happen and then looked at the consequences. So what I'm going to show you is what happens at, if a tipping point happens in the Atlantic Overturning Circulation on top of the 2.5 degrees centigrade of global warming that we are heading towards on current policies worldwide. Well, on the left, we see the overall pattern of temperature change. And on the right, we see the even more alarming pattern of precipitation change. And the scale is in percent here. So you see extraordinary drying in parts of the planet, including across West Africa and the Indian monsoon region, but also across large parts of Eurasia, including massive um, crop growing regions, linked particularly to the tipping point here uh, in its spatial signal. So that begs a few straightforward questions. Well, what would the impacts be on some sort of more human systems? Well, sorry to be parochial for a second, but um, as I'm in the UK and we actually have a good econometric model of um, land use decisions in the UK, we could feed the climate tipping point and global warming scenario into that um, model and basically show that if this climate tipping point were to happen, it would eliminate arable farming in the UK. Unfortunately, that would be the least of our worries because the drying is that's causing that disaster for arable, arable farming is so acute in the southeast of the UK that we, there would be a massive water deficit for most of the, for the you know, most densely populated part of the UK. And we'd be looking at a massive infrastructure project to try and pipe water from where it's still raining on the west western seaboard of Great Britain. Looking more globally, though, uh, this combination of global warming and this specific tipping point would have profound implications for the the viable area over which you could grow the major staple crops, particularly of wheat and maize. Rice is a kind of mixed picture, but here we see in purple places where suitability for growing the crops is declining, green where it's getting better. Well, it's a double whammy effect, basically. Global warming is bad for wheat and maize production. The tipping point the AMOC collapse is also really bad for wheat and maize production, and their effects are at least additive, if not multiplicative, so that we more than halve the viable area for growing wheat and maize worldwide. And sure, I would surmise that that would cause a food security crisis. And no doubt, if you tip a large bit of the climate system, it's going, there's going to be interactions to tipping points on other scales of system. In this case, case kind of downward tipping cascades where tipping a big system like that makes tipping a whole lot of littler systems more likely, which is sort of one of the many things summarized in this elegant table from a paper by Juan Rocker and others which also explores the possibility of uh, very occasionally you could have tipping point cascades from in the other direction, from small systems to large systems, although that's rarer. But there's a whole categorization of types of coupling across climate, ecological and social systems. 
And interestingly, Earth history, even as we begin to stare at it in more detail, shows us that when there were episodes of past abrupt climate change, surprise, surprise, there was coupled with abrupt change in ecosystems and also abrupt change in early societies, as uh, Victor Bobkin and others summarized in a recent paper. And here is a, a little schematic from the changes observed 14.7 thousand years ago in the abrupt warming that started what's called the Bolling Alarant. So for sure, we, we've got reason to get together to talk about cascading tipping point risks. And I just brought, pulled this out of the World Economic Forum's Global Risk Report that was published last week, ready for the World Economic Forum in Dasvos this week as we speak. And you may note that the environment and the climate are in there in the cascading risk landscape, but they do seem rather off to one side, very tightly coupled the you know, ecology and climate amongst itself, but rather weakly coupled, you might argue, to the rest of the network of risk. So I feel like we still have some work to do, perhaps in this transdisciplinary sense, to point to explain to everybody how fundamental tipping points in the green stuff could be for the rest of the stuff. To summarize, um, exceeding one and a half degrees centigrade of global warming could trigger multiple climate tipping points. There are general early warning signals before reaching a tipping point, and they've been detected in several of these tipping elements recently. The impacts of the most studied climate tipping point are severe and additional to the impacts of global warming, and I, I would add possibly existential risks. And clearly tipping point interactions and their cascading impacts across systems and scales further add to the risk they pose. So plenty of reason to meet together. Thanks for listening.